Sam Doster with Amateur Golf here, and I'm joined by Adam Barr, the director of the USGA Golf Museum, and we are standing right now in the Hall of Champions. Can you talk a little bit about the origination of the USGA Golf Museum? There's been a museum at the USGA back to the days when we were headquartered in Manhattan in 1936, actually two years older than the Baseball Hall of Fame, the oldest sports museum in America is the USGA Golf Museum. We moved out here to Far Hills in the early 70s after leaving Manhattan, and that's why we're in this lovely mansion now that was built 98 years ago. In 2008, we added on what we call the Arnold Palmer Center for Golf History, and the Hall of Champions is part of that, and it's one of my favorite places in the museum because it's so wonderfully quiet, and you get to see all the trophies in their glory. And more important than that, every year, these bronze plaques that are engraved with the name of every single champion from that year, starting in 1895 and going to the present day, part of the eternity of winning a USGA championship. And you can go through some of these plaques and see winners of amateur events that go on to professional greatness, uh, such as uh, uh, amateur winners like Billy Mayfair and Tiger Woods and Mark O'Meara and others who go on to great pro careers, uh, Lydia Ko, for example. It, they're all over the place. You can trace the history of golf just on these bronze plaques. Now this room here, the plaques date back to when? 1895, our first three championships, the U.S. Amateur, then one day later, the U.S. Open, and then a month after that, the U.S. Women's Amateur. The Hall of Champions, a beautiful room. Just the beginning of this tour, we're going to go visit the Bobby Jones room. We're going to talk about Francis we met, the Arnold Palmer room. Stick with us. It's going to be a fun tour. Adam, we're looking forward to it. It's a great day at the museum. All right, so now we are standing in front of the Francis we met legacy display. Of course, everyone knows, and we'll start there, the 1913 U.S. Open win. Yeah, what a story when a former caddy steps up and beats two of the best in the world over a very difficult golf course that he lived across the street from. This is New England's number one amateur of all time, probably. I mean, he, he devoted his life to amateur golf, never really wanted to turn pro. And after that 1913 U.S. Open, his biggest claim to greatness, as we've said, he's, he's won the U.S. Amateur twice in 1914 and 1931, so 17 years apart, the guy could really play. And just to go back to that U.S. Open win a little bit, isn't that the ultimate golf Cinderella story? I mean, I don't think there's anything that's, that's topped it since then. It's one of those turning points, absolutely, in the history of the game in this country. The founding of the USGA, the beginning of the championships in 1895. But in 1913, this story really caught fire in the sports world and developed for golf the kind of following that it gained in the decades to come. If this hadn't happened, U.S. golf might not have taken root as well as it did in the early part of the 20th century. And we've talked about we met on the course, but he also had a huge impact off the course. And uh, one place he was honored for his impact to the game of golf was when he was named the first American captain uh, by the RNA. Yes, indeed. A huge honor for him to be the first American. Of course, he was a force in golf, and the RNA recognized this, much as they did with Bob Jones. They loved him as well. But it was we met who became the first captain, and that red coat that the captain gets, he wore it with great pride. And as captains do, he drove in in the fall meeting in 1951 from the first tee of the old course in St. Andrews. And uh, that was kind of another beginning of an era in American golf. We're over in the Bobby Jones section of the USGA Museum, and Adam, uh, he just had one heck of a career. It's incredible when you think about, in the modern day, your very top sports heroes are professionals, the Tom Brady's of the world. In the 1920s, an amateur golfer, somebody who was doing it as a hobby, remember Jones was trained at Georgia Tech and Harvard to be a lawyer, but doing it as a hobby, he became one of the biggest sports figures of the century. And we try to memorialize as much of that as we can at the museum in this section here in the main exhibit and then in the special Bob Jones room with everything from his passport that he used for overseas trips to a Sullivan Award from the Amateur Athletic Union to tickets to the, all the various champions he played in and scorecards. People actually throng to these places to see an amateur play golf. It's pretty amazing when you think about it in modern terms. It really is, and it just wasn't his play in the U.S. amateurs. He had success overseas. He had success everywhere he played, and he stopped at a young age as well. He did. He stopped at age 28 to pursue his career in the law. Always stayed close to golf and, of course, helped to found Augusta National Golf Club. But really, during his career, he was a force to be reckoned with. He struck the ball so well, he hit it very far. 
Nobody who had any aspirations to win big in amateur golf in the 1920s and 1930s could do it without getting through Bob Jones. All right, of course, we're going to go take a, a look at the Bobby Jones room in a little while. But before we do, we have a famous club over here, the Calamity Jane II that Bobby Jones used. Yeah, and this is the one he used to win most of his very big events, uh, maybe the most famous golf club in the world. And if you are an equipment freak, you're really going to like looking at this because look at the way the windings go up the shaft in three places. And there's a little bit of offset. And you can see, if you look at video of Jones putting over those greens, which, of course, were a different kind of turf than we have today, it's a very wristy stroke, and you can see why he relied on this putter to just kind of pop it towards the hole like a lot of players did at the time. Also, like all of us, good or bad players and everything in between, if you find a putter that's working for you, you stick with it. And he stuck this, with this one for a long time. This is a club we're very proud to have in the museum. Now we've moved on to the Bob Jones room, and this here is, is another, just another great room. This is uh, just a wonderfully engaging room with the original paneling from when the mansion was built in 1919. And it just seems fitting for Jones, the deepness of the color of the wood and the depth of his, his manhood and his honor and his career. And you see in this room, among other things, that Mr. Jones inspired a lot of art, like this Bob Pack bronze that we're standing next to, paintings by Everett Raymond Kinsler and Thomas Stevens, some of which are famous images that people have seen of Mr. Jones, plus photographs of his swing sequences and medals from his championships. It's just a, a, a small tribute to a magnificent career and really a, a hallmark of amateurism in golf. All right, the Bob Jones room. Right now we're going to head across the hall and go to the Arnold Palmer room. We are in the Arnold Palmer room right now. He won the U.S. Amateur in 1954. He often credited that win as the springboard into his magnificent career. And this room here, Adam, just a fantastic room. I mean, right here, we're right next to uh, a depiction of Arnold Palmer's grip. There's so many ways to remember the late Mr. Palmer, and this is an interesting one, a sculpture by Tico Torres. Mr. Palmer often said that his father, Deacon, was the one who taught him how to put his hands on the club, and he never really deviated from that his whole career. If you were ever lucky enough to shake hands with Mr. Palmer, you realize what enormous bear paws he had. Your hand just disappeared in them. And he used his hands well, the strength and the flexibility of them, and put them on the club in the way you see in this wonderful bronze by Tico Torres, and that's a great way to remember Mr. Palmer's contributions to the game and his singular personality in the game that took him through that magnificent career you mentioned. And there's so many different things in this room. You just look around. You have uh, a display for his aviation. Uh, you have other artifacts from his playing career. There's just so many different things for people to wander around and learn about the great career and life of Arnold Palmer. That's right. You begin to realize what a cultural force he was on Wheaties boxes and in so many ways. There's a Palmer for President button over here. He was really a force in and out of sports because of the strength of his personality and his swashbuckling style and go-for-broke style on the golf course, which people just loved. They, they lived and died with his successes and failures on the golf course and the fact that he never really held back. If there was a flag to go for, he went for it. And his impact on the game is... It it's one of those that's going to be everlasting. It is because down to the generation of current professionals, the, the very elites in the game, men and women, they use him as a, kind of a, a touchstone of how to conduct oneself in golf and in sports. He's going to be remembered for a very long time. When you come into the USJ Golf Museum and you turn right, right from the desk, this is the very first room you see, and that's by design, uh, because Mr. Palmer, not only did he play well and win the 1960 U.S. Open, the 1981 U.S. Senior Open, but he also helped us off the golf course by helping institute our members program in 1975. He visited with President Gerald Ford and made him member number one and was its chairman all the way up until he died. So uh, he, he really intersected with us in very helpful ways uh, and uh, helped propel golf in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. All right, so we've walked down the hall, and we were just in the Arnold Palmer room. Now we're in the room of his greatest rival, Jack Nicklaus. Like Palmer, he won the U.S. Amateur, Nicklaus winning it in 1959 and 1961. And then, of course, his first pro win is the 1962 U.S. Open, so I'd say his game was on at that time of his career, as it was many other times. We opened the Jack Nicklaus room in 2015. Mr. and Mrs. Nicklaus attended the opening, which we were very proud of. There's a lot of interactive exhibits in here that talk about his entire career 
as a kid who was a self-avowed sports nut, moving on to golf and uh, working with Jack Grout, and uh, then onward to his great amateur and professional career. Also, a lot in here about his career as a di designer of golf courses. His golf course architecture career by itself would be of Hall of Fame quality. So he really had two Hall of Fame careers, if you think about it. And looking around the room, so many great displays. One that caught our eye was the display uh, that includes Bob Jones. And Mr. Jones was something of a mentor to Jack, and uh, Mr. Jones also insisted that there always be a significant component of amateurism at the Masters. And so he was very pleased to know Jack and uh, to see Jack play well there. Of course, Jack went on to win six Masters as a professional, which was fantastic. But uh, he, he respected Mr. Jones immensely, and uh, Mr. Jones respected him, and it was a, a great relationship late in Mr. Jones's life. All right, so we have made it to the end of our tour of the USGA Golf Museum. Uh, just want to say a big thanks from all of us here at Amateur Golf. Adam Barr, the director of the USGA Golf uh, Museum, thanks for taking us around. A lot of great stuff, and we've really enjoyed our visit. Sam, thank you very much. The place rewards multiple visits, so come back anytime. We like to say Far Hills is not really that far away from the Northeast Corridor. Very easy to get to, and everybody's very welcome. Well, thanks again, Adam. Standing in front of a great photo of the late Arnold Palmer, this has been Amateur Golf and Sam Dostler at the USGA Golf Museum.